The tradition of women's literary circles in the Arab world dates back to the pre-Islamic period when the eminent literary figure, al kansa would stand in the UKAZ market in Mecca, reciting her poetry and airing her views on the scholarship of others. From this, a culture of literary criticism emerged among Arab women, and under the Umayyad dynasty, Sukaina bint al Hussein established the first literary salon in her home. The tradition was revived during the late 19th century, as a result of sweeping social, political and economic change within the Ottoman Empire and Europe's increasing political and cultural influence in the region. The initial pioneers of the Arab Salon were women from wealthy families in Greater Syria and Egypt, who returned influenced by interaction with European women during their time spent studying abroad and frequenting Parisian salons, or studying in schools run by European or American missionaries. The Salon evenings, run by women but attended by both men and women, provided a unique opportunity to have discussions about social, political and literary trends of the day. Though the tradition died out somewhat after the Second World War, it has left a lasting legacy on literary culture and women's issues throughout the Arab world. Indeed, more than 100 years later, the UN Arab Human Development Report echoes what many people in Arab societies were coming to realize at that time, an Arab Renaissance cannot be accomplished without the rise of women in Arab countries. Background to the 19th century literary societies Women and education The educational reforms of the 19th century, a period of sweeping social, economic and political transition, resulted from various undercurrents occurring at different levels within the realms of the Ottoman Empire from the Mashrek Greater Syria to the Maghreb North Africa. These trends were largely attributable to the increased European presence in the region and their secular ideas of modernity. At a societal level, the arrival of Christian missionaries supported by the European and American governments led to the creation of a formal system of education for girls, who had until this period received little or no education. Initially, this took the form of private institutions attracting wealthy and mostly Christian families. However, as these schools became more socially acceptable and affordable, the idea trickled down to the middle classes before finally reaching out to the poor. Thus, a new norm was becoming increasingly prevalent, the idea that girls should receive an education so as to afford them better marriage prospects, and more importantly, to provide them with adequate means in which to educate their children. At this point in time, the range of subjects offered to women was limited. However women seized these opportunities to learn, and showed admirable drive and determination. By the middle of the century, a sense of awareness and obligation for intellectual and social consciousness, especially the appreciation of women's plight, and the struggle for a voice in society became visible and public. A notable example of the contribution of Western missionaries to increasing educational opportunities for women was the work of Daniel and Abby Maria Bliss, an American couple who moved to Beirut in 1866 and subsequently set up the Syrian Protestant College which later became the American University of Beirut. In 1905, a nursing program that accepted applications from women was established, and in 1924, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences opened its doors to female students. The rumblings of reform taking place within Ottoman society reached the Sultanate, and were eventually echoed at an institutional level. The Ottoman regime, in order to counteract the threat of political and religious influence from the Christian missionary schools and due to the realization that the empire could not hope to survive without learning the modern natural sciences, began to implement its own reforms Tanzimat. According to the Arab historian, Eugene Rogan, the reforms introduced by the Sultanate had little effect on the subjects of the empire. 
However, by the 1850s and 1860s, the fruits of reform were visible in the daily life. The third and arguably the most important current that led to the existence and improvement of women's education in the 19th and early 20th century was due to European colonialism and its legacy. Napoleon's short-lived occupation of Egypt (1798–1801) was relatively unsuccessful by French standards. However, their revolutionary ideas and imports in the field of technology and education were to prove more durable in Egypt and the rest of North Africa. Under the leadership of Muhammad Ali, an admirer of French innovation and technology, interactions and exchanges between Egypt and France in the cultural, academic and scientific fields increased during his reign indeed, it was not just male students who spent time abroad. Notable Arab hostesses or saloniers such as Mayy Ziadar spent time in France, and the Egyptian feminist and occasional hostess of Salon Evenings, Hudashar Rawi, used to grant scholarships to writers enabling them to study in Europe at her own expense. Ideas of educational reform and feminism were also occurring elsewhere in the Arab world, with the Syrian writer and scholar, Boutras al-Bustani in Lebanon among the first to advocate women's right to education in 1847. Two decades later in Tunisia, the reformist, Ahmed Khairedine, stressed the importance of women's education in the running of households and raising children. This was a small, but crucial step in the emancipation of women in society. Later in Egypt, after the British took over from the French in their civilizing mission of Egypt they also contributed to the reform of women's education. In his work entitled, Modern Egypt, Lord Cromer, who had served for almost 30 years as High Commissioner of Egypt. By confining the sphere of women's interest to a very limited horizon, cramps the intellect and withers the mental development of one half of the population in Muslim countries. By 1924, when the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at the American University of Beirut began accepting applications from women, the norm that, knowledge rather than ignorance preserves women's dignity and morality, had been firmly established. In the face of confinement and exclusion from the formal education system, middle class women overcame their exclusion and marginalization from society, holding informal literary or study circles in their family homes. Moreover, women such as Mayy Ziadar and Mary Ajami went on to pursue higher education in Europe, returning to set up well known salons and contributing immeasurably to literary circles, print, and production in the Arab world. Topic. Women and the public sphere At the turn of the 19th century, the idea of the harem continued to linger in many Arab societies. Women of the urban middle and upper classes were confined to the domestic sphere, and the vast majority remained unseen and unheard in public life. Necessity afforded female members of the lower and rural classes slightly more freedom, as they were needed to work the land in order to support their families. Women's issues began to emerge from the background, albeit slowly, in the late 19th and early 20th century, with the likes of Qasim Amin calling the seclusion of women an injustice and advocating partial empowerment of women. However, the majority of prominent feminist writers were men, and the presence of women activists in the public sphere was virtually non-existent. The Salon and its male participants, many of whom were well-known intellectuals, provided them with a means in which to express their ideas and opinions in private, whilst accessing the male-dominant public sphere through their lively discussions and debates. In her thesis entitled Arab Women Going Public, Mayy Ziadar and her literary salon in a comparative context, Boothina Kaldi remarks that women of the salons overcame the obstacle of gender inequality, "...by bringing public men into their private salons and hence creating a public sphere from the very heart of the private one." The essays and letters produced by hostesses and participants of the salons on the topics discussed also had a considerable impact on society at the time, and in particular, the nurturing of the Arab Renaissance and women's emancipation. 
The publication of letters by is interpreted by Jürgen Habermas in his writing on the public sphere as bridging the gap between the private sphere in which women gathered, and the public sphere that they sought to shape and conquer. <laughs> women and the Arab cultural renaissance The Arab Renaissance al or Arabic, Almd was an endeavor to reach a compromise between contemporary practices similar to those in Europe and a shared Arab heritage, in the hope of shaping a new vision for an Arab society in transition. The relationship between women's literary salons and the Arab awakening, as it was also referred to, is of paramount importance. Not only were meetings of literary figures an integral part of the Renaissance, but from the beginning of the Arab Renaissance in the 19th century, women came to realize the strong bonds between the literary cultural, social and political, and that the literary movement was key to liberating the collective consciousness from the traditional norms that had stunted their progress. Men also began to acknowledge the importance of women's emancipation to national liberation and development at this time, and there is no doubt that increased interactions between male and female intellectuals within literary circles made an invaluable contribution. One of the first men to write about the liberation of women was Qasim Amin, an influential literary figure at the turn of the 20th century, argued for the emancipation of women for the sake of the Arab Renaissance, as did al tatawi Both of these men frequented Mayy Ziyada's salon in Cairo. Thus women's desire for emancipation and men's nationalist dreams became the keystone in the advancement of society in 1847 two great literary figures of the Arab cultural renaissance Boutras al-Bustani and Nasif al-Yazaji founded the first literary society Jamiat al-Adab wal Ulum the literary and scientific society its members were exclusively Syrian Christians and Europeans living and working in diplomatic and missionary circles. However, ten years later, al Jamia al Ilmiya al Suriya, the Syrian Scientific Society, was established and attracted Western educated Muslims and Druze as well as Christians. In 1917, the Tunisian literary figure, Hassan Hosni Abdul Wahab wrote about the urgent need for educated Muslim young women to take charge of the future and to «awaken the nationalist spirit», as without this, life would turn to nihilism and its consequences. Only a few years later in the 1920s, Manwia al-Wartani and Habiba al-Minshari, became the leaders of a dynamic women's movement in Tunisia. Like these Tunisian pioneers, women of the upper and middle classes across the increasingly imagined Arab world began to reap the benefits of education, and many of them began to focus on writing and joined their male counterparts in contributing to the Arab Renaissance. One woman of particular significance to the awareness of the Arab Renaissance amongst women was Princess Nazal Fadl. C. Her salon seems to have had an effect on its male guests, who were usually prominent members of the nationalist cause. The tradition of women's printing and press, an integral part of middle class circles and the Renaissance, was also intertwined with the literary salon. Many hostesses produced letters and essays on issues discussed in salons, such as equality, women's rights, and nationalism. In Palestine, for example, the press became a partisan for the women, who used it as a transmitter and a publicist for their activities. The Lebanese journalist, Hind Norfel published the first monthly journal, Al Futter in 1892 in Egypt, encouraging women to think of journalism as a respectable occupation. Other journals, many published by Lebanese women in Egypt, followed suit. Anas al Jalis, al Ayla, al Mara, al Zara, Fatat al Shark, al Amal al Yadoria, and al Aris, the Bride, which was published by Mary Ajami. It is worth noting that this publication did not focus solely on women's issues, but also those related to the Renaissance and nationalism. Whilst the environment in which these female literary figures were operating in was becoming more and more conducive to women's issues, the road to equality and liberation was by no means free from obstacles, and many women published articles under pseudonyms. The Salon
Topic: Terminology. The French word salon, which was first uttered in 17th century France, comes from the Italian word sala and was used to define a large reception hall or reception room in a private residence. Later, it was used when referring to social gatherings in 19th century France. The word found its way to Egypt with the Napoleonic expedition and was one of many traces of the French Egyptian encounter 1798 to 1801 and its legacy. Whilst the word salon itself was a European import, there were various words in Arabic that were used to describe various kinds of social gatherings in the Arab world. According to the academic and expert, Bouthina Kaldi, the terms nadwa or nadi or muntada were used traditionally to indicate the call on people to gather for a purpose. The word majlis, however, such as the majlis of the first hostess of an Arab salon, Sukaina bint al Hussein, has the specific meaning of assembly, a gathering that might have a more regular or permanent nature in terms of time and place. Kaldi goes on to say that the frequenters of the more modern Arab salons were obviously aware of these, and often used both the French and the Arab words to refer to the gatherings, implying the synthesis of both Arab and European influences in the salon culture. Topic: The first salon. The history of the literary salon in the Arab world, of which little is known, dates back far longer than one would expect. Sukaina bint Hussein (735–743) began running her salon centuries during the Umayyad dynasty, well before the idea was first introduced to 17th-century Europe. She was a highly regarded woman of great intelligence, and an expert in fashion and literature. She was the first woman to open her house to male and female guests, and organized evenings of music, literary criticism and poetry. <laughs> <laughs> European influences Many of the Arab women who founded literary salons received at least part of their education in Europe or in European missionary schools, and were thus exposed to certain aspects of European culture, including the salon tradition. In this regard, the great impact of the colonial powers and the imposition of their culture and values on the region cannot be underestimated. However, that is by no means to say that the Arab women's literary salon was a passive imitation or export of European ideas. Rather, those men and women who travelled to Europe or who were well read in European literature selected elements of the European tradition and fused them with the traditional Arab salons of old, which was typical of the Arab Renaissance. Moreover, in 1890, one of the French saloniers, Eugénie Le Brun, chose to hold a salon evening in Cairo in an effort to learn more about women's circles in Egypt, and to encourage the revival of the tradition. One of the salons said to have had an influence is Madame de Rambouillet's salon, which opened in 1618 and was held at the Hôtel de Rambouillet in Paris. It was the first and most famous salon in French history. Rambouillet made sure to distinguish her salon from an academy, and emphasized entertainment as well as enlightenment. Like the later literary salons in the Arab world, the gatherings bore witness to the mingling of the literary elite, with male intellectuals and middle-class women. In a similar fashion to the salons in Cairo, topics such as religion, philosophy and history would be discussed, but it is noted that Rambouillet made sure the treatment of the subject was not heavy-handed." Mayy Ziadar admired the French «salonniers» and made sure to write copious materials on the well-known French hostess, habitué and prominent woman of aristocratic Parisian society, Madame de Sévigne, who was herself influenced by her time spent at the Hôtel de Rambouillet. 
The great Egyptian nationalist and writer, Taha Hussein, who began attending Ziyada's salon after she requested Ahmad Lutfi al Said bring him along on a Tuesday evening, comments on the fusion of Arab and European influences that created the salons of the late 19th and 20th centuries. Mayy revives by this salon a long established Arab practice, just as she transfers to Egypt a long established European practice, ancient and modern. Topic: An evening spent in the salon. Unlike salon sessions in England, which sometimes took place during the day or over several days, the salons in cities such as Cairo, Jerusalem, and Aleppo were usually held in the evening or at night in the family homes of saloniers. One of the less well-known salons in Beirut, for example, was convened on three consecutive full moon nights each month, where male and female guests stayed awake until dawn, enjoying the entertainment and lively literary discussions. It was the norm for saloniers to invite participants, and with notable exceptions such as Mayy Ziadar who invited guests from different social standings in order to give young writers the opportunity to show off their talents to a discerning audience. The majority of salons were a space for male and female members of the educated middle class elite. Within the confines of the salon, the free flow of conversation and reciprocity was encouraged, and a sense of equality was fostered. The salon evenings were also regarded as arbiters of music and literature, as well as places where social and political ideas were aired and discussed, and where guests could embrace new trends and fashions exported from Europe. There was something unique about these salon sessions, according to the historian Keith Wattenpaff, who lends a description of a salon evening. Soirees were unrelated men and women circulated with one another freely, and where Christians and Muslims, who shared a similar educational background, drank and smoked cigarettes—rather than sharing a nargila hookah pipe—together while they sat in straight back chairs around high tables. The tone and topics of discussion were usually at the discretion of the saloniers or hostesses, who administered the conversation. Of course, every salon was slightly different, but most evenings offered a mix of serious and light-hearted conversation, with musical entertainment in some cases. As the conversation flowed, it was not uncommon for guests to color their conversations with personal anecdotes or local gossip. Indeed, it was thought to be a necessary talent of a successful hostess to encourage such digressions. As these salons were conducted during the Arab Awakening, which advocated a synthesis of tradition and modernity, the use of fuchsia classical Arabic was emphasized. Unfortunately, specific topics of conversation in the literary salons have remained somewhat of a mystery over the years. However, in Yatana Karshan, they discuss, a fictional portrayal of a salon session held in her house in which the subject of equality was discussed at length. Mayy Ziadar gives a good indication of the content, atmosphere and interactions between male and female participants in her salon. Anton Shah' Rawi also encapsulates the opulent evenings spent in a Syrian salon with his vivid description. Wearing either all black or all white dresses ordered from Paris, Marash hosted the mixed evening get togethers in which literary topics as varied as the Mu'alakar, a cycle of seven pre Islamic poems, or the work of Rabelais were discussed. Chess and card games were played, and complicated poetry competitions took place. Wine and Araq flowed freely, participants sang, danced, and listened to records played on a phonograph. Topic. Men who visited the Salon A number of notable men, famous for their ideas and writing frequented the literary salons and contributed to the discussions. Some of them developed friendships with the female hostesses and asked them for their advice and opinions on their work. Among those who visited the salons was the advocate of women's rights and writer, 
Qasim Amin, the Islamic reformists, Al Imam Muhammad, Abdu and Raifa Rafi, Al Tatawi, leader of the Egyptian Wafd party, Saad Zaglul, Lutfi Al Sayed, the literary critic and journalist, Abbas Mahmud Al Akkad, the Syrian poet, Khalil Mutran, the journalist Muhammad Hussein Haikal, the poet Ahmad Shorchi, the Egyptian Prime Minister Botris Ghali, and the Egyptian nationalist and writer, Taha Hussein. Several of these men published articles and books on women's rights, including Raifa Arafi al and Qasim Amin, who is said to have found the inspiration for his seminal works, Tahir al-Mara the liberation of women and al-Mara al-Jadida the new woman in Princess Nasli al-Fadl's salon. Topic: <laughs> Notable literary salons and societies. Topic: Marash's Salon, Aleppo. Mariana Marash's Salon, the first salon in the 19th century revival movement, was run from the house she shared with her husband in Aleppo. The habitual gathering offered a private realm in which male and female guests could mingle, network, and discuss the fashionable topics of the time. Marash would often entertain her guests by singing and playing the piano. Regulars at the salon included prominent literary figures and politicians, such as Abd al Rahman al Kawakibi, Kustaki al Himzi, Rizkala Hassan, Kamal al Ghatsi, and Victor Kayat. <laughs> Princess Nasli Fadl's Salon Cairo. Nasli Fadl was one of the first women to revive the tradition of the literary salon and contributed immeasurably to the cause of women's emancipation in the Arab world. She began to invite guests to her Cairo salon towards the end of the 19th century, although the absence of female participants in her salon evenings should be noted. Like Mariana Marash, Fadl added to the ambience in her salon by playing the piano, while one of her male guests sang and her Tunisian maid danced. The men who frequented her salon were prominent in Egyptian and Arab society, including statesmen, diplomats, journalists and literary figures. Among the regular visitors to her salon was the renowned Islamic reformist thinker, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, as well as Qasim Amin, Botris Ghali and Saad Zaglul, to name but a few. <laughs> the dawn of Syria Beirut. In 1880, the Lebanese writer Mayim Nimr Makariush established the dawn of Syria Literary Society in Beirut. The Association of the Arab Women Awakening Beirut. This literary society was founded by Muslim women in Beirut in 1914. Katie Antonia Salon Jerusalem. Katie Antonius ran what has been described as the focal point of Jerusalem social life from the home she shared with her husband, the celebrated Arab nationalist, George Antonius, during the Mandate period. The Salon provided local journalists, officials, officers, politicians and European diplomats with an opportunity to network and discuss the latest literary, social and political issues. Her parties have been described as «elaborate affairs» with «evening dress», «Syrian food and drink», and «dancing on the marble floor». From time to time Antonius invited the boys from her orphanage to her Salon evenings, as well as her array of famous guests. Topic M A Y Y Z Yarda's Salon, Cairo. Shortly before the outbreak of the First World War, Mayy Ziadar began to host well-known men and women from intellectual, literary, and political circles across the Arab world. Meetings were held at her family home, the first salon in Cairo in which men and women met together in the same room. 
In terms of etiquette, Ziadar maintained a «tactful correspondence» with guests of her salon, who were expected to inform her of their attendance through letters as a matter of courtesy. She and her guests also published letters they wrote from conversations in the salon. A Syrian Christian journalist, Salim Sarkis, a typical representative of the educated middle class clientele who used to frequent the gatherings, attended Ziyada's salon, which was held on Tuesday evenings for 23 years, 1913 to 1936. The influence of Ziada's time spent in the salons of France is obvious, with Sarkis comparing her to notable French salonnières. The journalist gives the reader a rare insight into the atmosphere of the salon in the following description. In the evening of every Tuesday the house of Mr. Ilias Ziadar, the owner of Al Marusa newspaper, turns into a luxurious house in Paris, and his daughter Mayy, the Syrian young woman who is still in her twenties, into Madame de Stael, Madame Rekamia, Ayesha al Baraniya, Waladar bint al Mustakfi, and Wada al Yazaji. Mayy Ziadar's salon turns into an UKAZ fair, an annual fair in pre-Islamic Mecca, where the likes of Al Kansar and other literary greats recited poetry, where literary, philosophic, and scientific ideas propagate. The salon evenings ended after her mother's death in 1932, as social pressure would not permit an unmarried woman to enjoy the company of men without members of her family present. A eulogy by Syrian poet Khalil Mutran mourned Ziyada's death and the passing of her salon. Omayy. The house was deserted, where is your salon which visitors frequented? The best elite of the East and West in nobility and erudition seek protection under your boundless wing. <laughs> Huda Sharawi's Salon, Cairo, Beirut Shah Arawi's salon only met sporadically, but was well attended by many famous political figures and intellectuals, including Ahmad Shorchi, Gabrielle Takla and Muhammad Hussein Haikal. She loved music, and would often play the piano long into the night whilst in her salon. Shah Arawi used to award a literary prize every year, and would also encourage young writers from her salon by sending them to study in Europe at her own expense. The Women's Literary Club Damascus. The Damascus Women's Literary Club was founded by Mary Ajami around 1920, and was aimed at strengthening the bonds between women. It held public meetings, giving its members a platform on which to air their views on literary and political issues. Occasionally they discussed politics, but they were mainly interested in reviving classical Arabic literature and familiarizing themselves with modern Western thought. According to Joseph T. Zidon, those who frequented the salon were treated to the melodic tones of Mary's sister's piano playing, as well as the insightful and witty comments of Mary herself, who was highly praised for her ability to run the intellectual discourse and was acknowledged as a skilled talker. Sukhina's Salon Damascus. Thiraya al hafiz a school teacher and popular feminist, launched a salon evening in her house in Damascus in 1953. The salon was named after Sukhina bint al Hussein, the first Arab woman to host a salon. It was open to both men and women, though only the latter were in charge of running the proceedings. Its objectives included Raising literary and artistic standards, creating strong bonds and cooperation among its members, publishing their works, translating Western literary works into Arabic, and translating Arabic literature into foreign languages. It continued to run until 1963, when its founder moved to Egypt. <laughs> Pioneering women behind the salons 
Mariana Marash was the first Arab woman in the 19th century to revive the tradition of the literary salon in the Arab world, with the salon she ran in her family home in Aleppo. Zainab Fawaz, 1860–1914, who founded a salon in Damascus. Princess Nasli Fadl C. Huda Shah Arawi 1879 became one of the most famous feminists in the Arab world. In 1914, she formed al Itihad al Nisa'i al Tadibi, Women's Refinement Union, where Egyptian and European came together to discuss new ideas. This led to the establishment of the Jamiat al Ruchiyya, Adabi Ali al Sayyidat al Misriyat, Egyptian Ladies Literary Improvement Society. In the 1920s, Shah'Arawi Arawi began to hold regular meetings for women at her home, and from this, the Egyptian Feminist Union was born. She launched a fortnightly journal, L'Egyptian in 1925, in order to publicize the cause. Mayy Ziadar is the best known of the women associated with the literary salons, and was a leading figure in literary circles throughout the Arab world. Mary Ajami founded the Damascus Women's Literary Club in 1920. Katie Antonius 1984, born to Egyptian Lebanese parents, experienced a privileged upbringing and education in Alexandria as the daughter of a prominent Egyptian publisher and landowner. In 1927, she married the intellectual and Arab nationalist, George Antonius. She was a fashionable socialite known for her wit, humor, kindness, and charm, as well as her infamous parties and salon evenings. As well as her salon, Antonius established a boys' orphanage in Old Jerusalem called Dar al-Aulad. Thuraya al-Hafiz launched her own literary and political salon in Damascus, which was open to both genders. The salon was convened in her own house and was named after Sukaina bint al-Husayn, the great-granddaughter of Prophet Muhammad, who presided over the first literary salon in Muslim history. The salon was launched in 1953. <inaudible> <inaudible> Modern-day salons In the 1960s, women and their ideas started to become part of the mainstream culture, and thus the important role of women-run salons declined in its importance. That said, the Women's Literary Club, which was founded by Mary Ajami in 1922, continues to run in Damascus, and was attended regularly by the novelist Ulfat Idleby until her death in 2007. In 2010, a new weekly salon evening for young male and female writers and literary enthusiasts was launched in the basement of a hotel in Damascus. The popular event held on Monday evenings, named Beit al-Qasid House of Poetry, is an opportunity for new voices rather than established poets or writers, and attracts both Syrians and foreigners. <laughs> 